Now there's the same general advice as we had before, so uh, you can read through that. Just be ready, be prepared physically. Make sure you get plenty of sleep. Uh, make sure you know the ideas, not just the procedures. Usually we like to have at least one problem where we like turn it slightly, where it's not exactly the type of problem that you see in a book or in the, or in the test or exactly like we see in class, but it has all the same tools and if you understand the processes, you're like, I can modify this and I can get what I need. So we do like to sort of say, look, you know, it's not just enough to say, I can repeat what I've seen before. Because that's not what we want you to be able to do. We want you to go beyond that. Yes, I want you to solve things that you've seen before. But I also want you to adapt to things which are slightly different. Because if you can start doing that, then maybe a year or two down the road, you can adapt to solving things which are wildly different. And then that's where the real fun starts. The real fun starts when you solve the new problems, the hard problems. Work on the ones you know first before getting stuck. Um, they are roughly speaking from easiest to hardest. So make sure you don't spend all your time on problem one. Make sure you save a little bit of time towards the end. Okay. And of course, no matter the outcome, we still like you. We do. We, we do. We really want you all to succeed. All right, now what do you need to know? As far as the test, this test covers applications of derivatives, so you should know your derivatives, and in particular, you should know these eight by heart. If you can know those eight derivatives by heart, that'll get you all the way through Calc 3. Those are the derivatives we care about. Uh, what about the rules? You should remember the product rule and you should remember the chain rule. We've done those before. You can, if you like, memorize the quotient rule. The reason I didn't put that in the list was because I was running out of space, but also because the quotient rule is really a combination of the other rules. And so if you can remember the other rules, the quotient rule isn't needed. The last two are the ones we talked about since the, the first test. So those are the new ones, so you should know how do I take the derivative of the inverse of a function? Derivative of f inverse of x is 1 over the derivative of f inverse of x. And the other one, the very bottom here, is sort of a shorthand logarithmic differentiation. So if you have a derivative of something which looks complicated, you say, well, I don't want to deal with something that looks complicated. You can, you can do that using logarithmic differentiation because logs have a way of pulling things apart. Multiplication becomes addition, division becomes subtraction, exponents come down. So logs are a great way to take something complicated, very compact, and pulling it apart into little pieces, each piece which is not so bad. And then, of course, beyond just the, what did we learn about derivatives, we learned about applications of derivatives, and you could say that we've learned one or two things. So, um, one or two, one or two. Now, I will remind you that this slide, as with all slides this semester, are on the course website, as well as on the Canvas page. So if you're worried about, like, I gotta write all this down, or I gotta take a picture, just go to the Canvas and download it. And then you can print it out very nice, because I've heard engineers get lots of printing credits. All right, so what are things you should be able to do? Implicit differentiation. So that's when you have something where you have a function of y and x on one side equals a function of y and x on the other side. Maybe you have a function of y and x equals a constant. But you have a relationship where you cannot solve for y or you cannot solve for x. But you can still say, look, these are related. I, I, how, how do I take derivatives? Well, the answer is you just take the derivatives of both sides with respect to x. And when you get to anything which is y, you say, ah, the derivative of y is the derivative of y with respect to x. And that's the idea. So it's actually not a very hard idea. Just remember the chain rule. Logarithmic differentiation we talked about. Logarithms pull things apart. So it's very useful when you have things which are crammed together. Linearization is a fancy way of saying tangent lines are good approximators, which should not, not surprise us at all, because that's how we started thinking about tangent lines, is that the, the function locally looks pretty flat, and the, that local flat thing is the tangent line. Related rates are saying, well, you have 
various variables which are changing, not necessarily with respect to each other, but with respect to something else. So we usually think of it as with respect to time. And you say, well, okay, how does one variable change as another variable changes? And what do you do? Well, in related rates, you find the relationships, that's the related part. Then you find the rates, which means take the derivative. So take the relationship, take the derivative of everything with respect to t, plug in what you know, solve for what you don't. Okay, the mean value theorem just says some point in the middle has an instantaneous rate of change equal to the average rate of change at the endpoints. The extreme value theorem says that nice functions have an absolute max and min. And this one, you sort of channel your, your inner Santa Claus. You say, look, I'm going to make a list, I'm going to check it twice, then I'm going to find out which points have been absolute maxi and which ones have been absolute mini. Well, okay, mini and nice didn't work so well. But for, for that, it says, look, if you want to find absolute min and max, you check the critical points, which means where the derivative is zero or undefined, and, and what I call the boundary, book apparently calls it endpoints, has been pointed out to me, but I like to call it boundary because then it makes more sense when you hit calc three. Once you have a list of those points, plug each one of those into your function. Largest one is your absolute max, smallest one is your absolute min. The first derivative, going to our next column, can tell you about how the function is changing. In particular, it can say, is my function increasing or decreasing? Where my first derivative is positive, that's increasing. Where my first derivative is negative, that's decreasing. And I can use that information to classify local points. In other words, is this point locally a min or locally a max? And I do that by saying what's happening on both sides. So for example, if I'm decreasing, then I'm increasing, what am I? I'm a min. Decreasing, then increasing. If I'm increasing, then decreasing, what am I? I'm a max. Okay, so good, you cracked the code. Second derivative tells us about how the first derivative is changing, and that translates into what's called concavity. Concave up versus concave down. So concave up would be a bowl that holds water. Concave down would be a bowl which the water has fallen out of. And you can use that information to classify critical points. If your second derivative is positive, means you're concave up, what kind of critical point do you have? It's a min. If your second derivative is negative, you're concave down, what kind of critical point do you have? I have a max. Uh, you can use all this information to sketch curves, and curve sketching is just industrial strength connected dot. Find the critical points, plot those, find inflection points, and you connect. So curve sketching is actually pretty easy. Optimization, also known as let's make a long word problem. We love word problems. There's at least two, at least. Find what's being optimized as a function of one variable. So that's pretty intuitive. And then once you have a function that's uh, one variable, we say, okay, find the mins and maxes. So it goes back to what we did before. Take the derivatives, find the critical points, see do I need boundary points or endpoints do I need to worry about. Classify them as mins and maxes if I need to. If I only have one critical point, then you know, that's the one I need. And interpret the result means figure out what exactly am I looking for. Am I looking for where my parameter is? Am I looking for maybe it's like a, uh, maybe I have a silo and I want to maximize the volume. Well, do I want the volume? Do I want the, the lengths? And what, what do I want? And so make sure you read the question to answer what's being asked for. Give the answer that was being asked for. So the Hopital, spelled with a very fancy accent mark, is if you ever see a limit on this test, it's a Hopital problem. Because it's the only thing that we've done with limits since the first exam, and we're not trying to overlap the exams. So if you see a limit, you're going to think Le Hopital. What is Le Hopital? It says if you go to zero over zero or infinity over infinity, then instead of doing f of x over g of x, do f prime of x over g prime of x and do that limit instead. Now, do you have to be 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity to apply Le Hopital? Kind of. In order to do this step, f of x over g of x, f prime of x over g prime of x, you do have to be a fraction. But there's still other things besides 0 over 0 which are not known. So what might you need to do? Rearrange. Yeah, so be prepared to rearrange if needed. 
Uh, and the last thing is Noon's Method, which we talked about last time, so it's still fresh. You remember that. Noon's Method is just a fun way of saying, hey, I'm trying to find uh, the answer to something, and I got a guess. Can I make a better guess? And the answer is yes. Use the tangent line to make a better guess. So the big thing about Newton's method is because you, we don't give you a calculator, there's not, not a lot we can ask, but we can ask about the recursion. We can say set it up. So know how to set up the recursion. So the recursion, when we say the recursion, it's, it's saying I have a guess, what's my better guess? And that's it. If you know that, you're good to go. See ya. So now you're feeling better. It's like, hey, that's not so bad. I've learned all this stuff. I've come to class. All right. So the goal for today is we're going to do the, uh, one of the practice exams. We're going to work through it. And I do know, yes, the solutions are online. But I want to talk about it, sort of like what's the thinking? How do we think about it, what to avoid, and, and how to go about solving it? And remember, we always want to get all the points. So we're always going to be careful and not make silly mistakes and, and check our, our work. Any questions before we start? Any last pieces of information you want to try to extract? I like your shirt. Oh, well, thank you. I, it's my Halloween shirt, you know. You could say this is the darkest timeline. But anyways. Okay. Well, since there are no questions, we have about uh, 35 minutes left in class and uh, six questions. Six minutes per question, that should be plenty of time. Okay, so suppose you have the following. H of x is f inverse of g of x. Now you might say, well, what is f of x and what is g of x? And the answer is, we don't know. Because what they did is they gave us some information below. So they didn't give us everything about f and g. They gave us sort of a sampling of points. So this is sort of testing us, not on can you take a derivative, but do you know the rules for taking derivatives? So what we want to do is we want to find a good linear approximation to h of x uh, at x equals 1. Of course, whenever I see the word linear approximation, in the back of my head, I can substitute that with the word tangent line. Because the linear approximation is just another way of saying I want to find the tangent line at 1. Once I have that, I'll estimate h of 1.05, and then there's a part b. Let me answer part a before I, I look at part b. So I want to find the linear approximation. So a tangent line, my linear approximation has the following form. It's going to be the value of the function evaluated at the point, which is 1, plus the derivative of the function evaluated at that point times x minus 1. And in general, it's h of a, whoops, yeah, h of a plus h prime of a times x minus a. So that's the 1 is, is because we're taking the tangent at 1, linear approximation at 1. So we need to fill that in. Uh, we'll fill that in as we go here. So h of 1 is f inverse of g of 1. So now we just sort of be patient and we work our way through it. We say, all right, well, what is g of 1? g of 1 is, is 3, because I can read that from the diagram. So g of 1 is 3, so that's f inverse of 3. So now, how do I find f inverse of 3? Well, to say f inverse of 3 says I need something where the output for f was 3. So I come to where I have f and I start scanning and I say, is there any place where I see 3 in this column? And the answer is yes, there is this place. The output for f is 3 at x equals 5, which means that f inverse of 3 is 5. Okay, so that's good. So now I can say that my linear approximation here starts with 5. That's my h of 1. Next thing is to find the h prime of 1. So instead of finding h prime of 1, I'm going to first find h prime of x in general. So I, I have here f inverse of g of x. When I take that derivative, I, there are two rules I'm going to need. What are my two rules? I'm going to need chain rules, one of them, and then the derivative of the inverse is the other one. So I have to know those two rules. But the good news is, I'm a good student and I know those two rules. I know the chain rule because that's like the most important rule. And I know that if I want to take the derivative of the inverse, that's 1 over the derivative of the function 
evaluate at the inverse. So this is going to test to see if we can follow the rules. So, so here I'm taking the derivative of f inverse of g of x. So that's going to be 1 over the derivative of f inverse of what I would plug in. Now normally I would put in x here, but remember it's a chain rule. I'm going to put in what I had here. So g of x goes here times, because that's the derivative of an inverse, I leave the inside alone. So the g of x still stays as g of x, times by the derivative of the inside. Now, what's the derivative of the inside? Is it f inverse or is it g? g, it's g. So the derivative of the inside, that's g prime of x. So h prime of 1 is going to be equal to 1 over f prime of f inverse of g of 1. And I just have to make sure I get enough parentheses times g prime of 1. But the good news is that I actually evaluate f inverse of g of 1. <coughs> I already know that this is 5. So this is 1 over f prime of 5 times g prime of 1. Well, what is f prime of 5? <laughs> Very conveniently, it's a nice number. f prime of 5 is 1. So that's 1 over 1. And g prime of 1 is negative 2. So I put it all together, I get negative 2. So that, negative 2, is what goes into h prime of 1. So this will become minus 2 x minus 1. And that's my linearization. Now you might notice that there was a lot on this table we didn't use. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. Sometimes they like to throw us some red herrings. You know, it's like, let's give you a little bit extra and see how you react. And we're, we're just going to be like, we'll take what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, we found the linear approximation. So in some sense, we've done the first task. Next task says, use this to estimate h of 1.05. Well, the, the point here is that the linear approximation approximates the function, hence the word approximation. So h of 1.05 is approximately the linearization at 1.05. So that would be 5 minus 2 times 1.05 minus 1. 1.05 minus 1, 0.05 times that by 2, double, would be 0.1. And then I subtract 0.1 from 5, gives me 4.9. All right. So now we're done with part A. Part A says 4.9. Now part B says, suppose you had a little bit extra. It didn't ask us to prove it, it just says we're, we're going to tell you this. It says that h double prime of 1 is less than 0. So what do I have? I have this tangent line, 5 minus 2 times x minus 1. So it, it goes downhill. And I have this point of tangency. So this tangent line, this is my linearization. And I'm told that h double prime of 1 is less than 0. And the question is, is this an overestimate or an underestimate? Well, it's second derivative is negative, so am I concave up or concave down? So I'm concave down. So does that mean that my curve, if you like, y equals, uh, well, h of x, will h of x be on this side or that side? I'm going to assume you meant this side, because that's the right answer. So this is where h of x would be, at least locally. Now, it's quite possible that it bends around, of course, and it probably does in many cases. But at least locally, and we only care about what's happening locally. So the question is, what's happening? Well, 1.05 for the linearization is here. For the function, it would be where? Underneath. So are we an overestimate or an underestimate? We're an overestimate. So we overestimate because we expect the curve to be below the linearization, L of x. When it says explain, we mean in one sentence. We don't need to have a, your life story. Uh, just one sentence is off enough. Okay, and that's number one. We're doing okay for time. 
on to number two. So, here we go. Evaluate the following limits. Now, as soon as I see the word limits, based on what we've said before, what do I think? Le hôpital. Le hôpital. All right, so I've got le hôpital running through my mind. All right. Now, in this case, it seems like they've set them up in pretty nice ways. So let's look at these limits. I have the limit. X goes to zero. Sine x minus x over x e to the x minus tangent of x. Now, what does this go to? Because if we're going to apply the Hopital, you always have to check. You can't just start taking derivatives. You always have to check something first. What do we need to check? Goes to zero over zero or infinity over infinity. Both are allowed. You have to check it's indeterminate before you apply it. If you don't check, we'll take off points. And remember, got to get them all. Got to get all those points. Got to get all those points. Okay, now the check is not meant to be very hard. Where does this go, go to? Well, the nu numerator goes to zero. The denominator goes to zero. So we can say something like this is indeterminate. And we apply a la hopital. Do we need to say that? I would say, uh, you, at, one of the things is we want to make clear that you know what you're doing. So, do you have to say the words, and thus it was written, apply the la hopital? No, you don't have to say that exact phrasing, but just say, I know I can apply la hopital. Something that indicates to us, you know what's going on. Because then we're like, good. Now that we know that you know what's going on, we can give you the points. We don't want you just to be a machine. We want you to, we want you to be able to say, I know what I'm doing. I'm not making stuff up. Okay, so I, I like to put a little LH just to say, this is my step where I applied Mr. Le Hopital. Okay, so this becomes the limit. What does the numerator become? Cosine x minus 1. What does the denominator become? <coughs> e to the x plus x e to the x minus secant squared x. Okay, and this goes to upstairs? Zero. And downstairs? Well, it becomes 1 plus 0 minus secant of 0 squared. Got to think about it for a second. What's secant of 0? One, so it goes to zero. Oh, cool. So this is indeterminate. You're right. We probably, I don't know if I can spell indeterminate right. I always spell it wrong, and then the, the, the spell checker says, this is how you're supposed to spell it. So hopefully that's the right spelling. So anyways, so we're going to apply it again. Cool. A double La Hopital. I, don't th I think I've never gone to a quintuple La Hopital. I've, I've done quadruple La Hopital rules before on tests. I've never done the quintuple. Not yet. Will this be the one? Probably not. It's very rare to get the quintuple Le Hopital rule. Someday, there's the dream. I dream the dream <coughs> of Le Hopital. Okay, what do we get upstairs? Negative sine x. What do we get downstairs? E to the x plus e to the x plus x e to the x minus the derivative of secant squared x, which is 2 secant of x times the derivative of secant, which is secant x tangent x. Now we can simplify that if we need to, but first, before we simplify, let's just check. Where does this go to? Upstairs we get, we get 0, because sine of 0 is 0. Downstairs we get 2. Wait, what? Really? Oh yeah, well tangent of 0 is 0, so that goes away. 0 times e to the 0 is 0, and then we get e to the 0 plus e to the 0, which is 2. Well, what do we do when it's 0 over 2? Yeah, we just say it's 0. We're done. As soon as we don't get 0 over 0, game over. Game over. We're done. We're done. Okay. So, it's 0. Is it okay to have an answer of 0? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. If it's the right answer, you should put it down. Okay, so that's A. All right, B. So what happens? Well, let's just check. What happens as I go to infinity? 
What does arc tangent do as I go to infinity? Well, what goes to zero? Does arc tangent go to zero or does arc tangent minus pi over two go to zero? Yeah. So what happens if you, if you don't know arc tangent yet? You should. It's a great function. It's the kind of function you want to take home and introduce to your parents at Thanksgiving. You're going to be sitting around the, 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 the table and you're going to say, everyone needs to say what they're thankful for. And you're going to say, I'm thankful that my teacher likes arc tangent because it's just such a simple function. And everything's great about it. And they're just going to be, okay, all right. We're done with the too much stuffing for you. All right. Anyways, so our tangent has a horizontal asymptote of pi over 2. So what's happening is our tangent, as I go to infinity, goes to pi over 2. Pi over 2 minus pi over 2 goes to 0. What happens downstairs? 1 over x goes to 0. So I get cosine 0 minus e to the 0, which is... Zero. So I'm going to zero over zero, which means what? Yeah, we uh, apply le hopital. Oh, my, mi ami, le hopital. Oh. Okay. True of arc tangent. Boy, I hope there's an arc tangent problem on the test. All right. What is the derivative of arc tangent? Uh, this warms the heart to hear so many people who know the derivative of arc tangent. Okay, of course, then the derivative of pi half is zero because it's a constant. Now, that's the st up, stuff upstairs. Stuff downstairs. Derivative of cosine one over x. Negative sine, and the one over x becomes <coughs> one over x because it's on the inside. You leave the inside alone. But then what happens? Multiply by the derivative of the inside. What's the derivative of one over x? Negative 1 over x squared. Okay. Minus, okay, derivative of e to the negative 1 over x. Well, e to anything is e to that anything times the derivative of that anything. What's the derivative of negative 1 over x? 1 over x squared. Okay, so far so good. Now, it looks like we'd have to do more lo hopital because upstairs, as x goes to infinity, We've got 1 over basically a huge thing, so that's going to 0. And then this is causing things to go to 0. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's just going to get worse. But remember, there, before the Hopi Tau, in the beginning, there was something that came before the Hopi Tau. Algebra. You're still allowed to do algebra. Even though you have this really cool tool, algebra still works. Okay, so what, is, what do I mean by algebra? Well, algebra, I mean here is you can do things like multiply top and bottom by x squared. So one of the things you should think about when you're doing problems is, how can I make this problem look nicer? So if I multiply top and bottom by x squared, then I'll make it x squared over 1 plus x squared. Downstairs, I'd have minus sine 1 over x. Uh, actually, be plus sine because minus minus makes a plus minus e to the minus 1 over x. And you might say, well, that's good, but I still have upstairs x squared over x squared. That's getting big. So what do we do? More algebra. How can I write x squared over 1 plus x squared so that I can clearly see what's happening? What I can do is I can just Rewrite the numerator as 1 over 1 plus 1 over x squared. So essentially, I can, I can come up here and say, let me just scale this down by multiplying the top and bottom of that. So what I'm doing here is I'm just saying, look, let me see if I can't rearrange it to be nicer. And if I do all of that, what happens? What happens to the numerator? Goes to 1, which means... Game over. Game over. Whatever happens, happens now. Okay, what happens downstairs? Sine of 1 over x is going to do what? Goes to 0, because it will go to sine of 0. e to the negative 1 over x will do what? Well, the e to the negative 1 over x is going to go to e to the 0, which is 1. Then there's a minus. So 0 minus 1. So our answer is? 
negative 1. And we're done. And we're done. Okay. So in this case, oh, wait, did I? I forgot to mark that this was a L'Hopital. I'd always like to put that in because I like that to be clear. Yes? Are we allowed to multiply just the top by 1 over x squared without the bottom? Yes. Because what you're doing here is we're multiplying by 1. You are allowed to multiply by 1 as often as you like. However, you should use some uh, constraint, a restraint perhaps I should say. No, don't go introducing like, well, let me multiply top and bottom by a million. Because I feel like a million is a nice number. No, no, no. You always choose a well-chosen one. Yes? Absolutely you are. Absolutely. Yes. There's lots of ways to manipulate things algebraically. I'm just saying this is one way. This is one way. Okay. Number three. This is a short problem, which must mean it's very easy. All right. Find the derivative of arctangent of tangent of x to the x power. Now, this doesn't look so bad. It's an arctangent and a tangent. The thing that makes this tricky is that little x right there. That x in the exponent is going to make things hard because I'm going to have a function to a function tangent of x to the x. I don't know how to deal with that yet. But then the good news is I don't have to deal with that because that function is on the inside. So I won't, I won't deal with it until I get to that point. So what rule am I going to need to start? The chain rule. Okay, so this says start by taking the derivative of arc tangent. Well, what is the derivative of arc tangent? 1 over 1 plus the inside squared, <coughs> tangent of x to the x squared. Do I need to rewrite this? No. I can leave it like that. Okay. So the derivative of our tangent is 1 over 1 plus the inside thing squared. But we're not done yet because what else comes in? What rule? Chain rule, which says I multiply by the derivative of the inside. Okay. So times the derivative tangent of x to the x. Now we have to face how do we handle the derivative of tangent of x to the x. So what tool makes this an easier thing to do? Logs. Logs bring exponents down. So I start putting on my logarithmic differentiation hat and say, hey, I'm going to do a logarithmic differentiation on you. And how do we do that? Well, we still have the stuff in the front. 1 plus tangent of x to the x quantity squared. For logarithmic differentiation, we multiply it by the function we're taking the derivative of, so tangent of x to the x, so that's the function, times the derivative of the log of tangent of x to the x. All right, so that's logarithmic differentiation without having to sort of do work on the side. Yes? Because that's the rule for, for, for logarithmic differentiation. So if you go back to page one, we had the rules for derivatives. This is logarithmic differentiation. So if you have the derivative of f of x, you pull the f of x out times the derivative of the log f of x. It works. I promise. I promise. Okay. Now, what happens here? Good stuff happens. In particular, what happens to this x? It comes down. Right there. Okay. So other than having to write a lot, this is not so bad. So tangent of x to the x squared, tangent of x to the x, the derivative of x log tangent of x. Now, what rule do I need? Product rule. Okay, so again, we write down everything we had before. 1 over 1 plus tangent of x to the x quantity squared, tangent of x to the x. And then the product rule says take the derivative of the first, which is 1, times the second, log tangent of x, plus x times the derivative of tangent of x, or sorry, derivative of log tangent of x, 
Now, whenever you're taking the derivative of log, it's very easy to remember. You put the function that you're taking the derivative of log of downstairs. So we're taking the derivative of log tangent. So tangent goes downstairs. What goes upstairs? The derivative of tangent, which is secant squared. Now, at this point, what do we do? Yeah, we're done. And you're probably saying, couldn't we simplify things? You could, but don't do it. One of the things is for two reasons. First off, any simplification exposes you to risking a stupid, silly calculus or copying mistake. And if you don't think that happens, please check your first exam. So it happens. The second thing is when it comes for us to grade it, when we see it like this, we can clearly see what you did. And it makes it so much easier for us to say, you got this, this, and that right, but you made one little mistake here. So this is a good place to stop and to box. All right. Three problems down, three to go. So this is, in some sense, this is, you might say, wow, that's a lot of text. But I'll tell you that if we were to put number six on the screen, it would take up the entire screen. That's how much text there is for number six. It's, it's a great story. It's a great story. OK, so here we go. Um, it is a sunny day, and you decide to go for a walk to get ice cream, which is, of course, you know, ice cream is a wonderful thing to do. Now, the ice cream store is at the opposite corner of a small square park that measures 12 meters by 12 meters. This probably was written by one of our international instructors. Meters? Come on. All right. That's okay. So here we go. 12 meters by 12 meters. And uh, maybe we're starting out over here. This is us. And of course, here's our favorite ice cream store. <laughs> All right. So that's where we want to get to. Now, what happens? You don't want to cut through the park because there's very aggressive Canadian geese. Now, I'd like to say that that narrows down where this story could happen, but in fact, there's always, there's always aggressive Canadian geese any anywhere you go. So, you know, this, this could have happened anywhere. Uh, so we're going to walk this way. We're going to walk on the outside. And at a certain point, when we get to this point, where we are five meters from the corner, we are walking, our pace is at 0 0.5 meters per second. And the question is, how fast is our distance to the ice cream store changing? So if we look at this picture, what are we reminded of? We see a right triangle. It's not just any triangle, it's the right kind of triangle. So what theorem? The Pythagorean theorem. So we should say that this side, which is the distance to the corner, is changing. We should give it a name. What should we call it? Q. Q? OK. That's fine with me. There's Q. <coughs> then there's this side, which is the distance to the ice cream parlor. And instead of getting crazy suggestions, I'm going to go ahead and write D for distance. All right, so we have Q and D. So what's true about Q and D? What do they satisfy? Pythagorean theorem, which says? Q squared plus 144 equals D squared. OK, well, that wasn't so bad. OK, so that's the relationship between the things we're trying to solve. After you find the relationship, what comes next? Derivatives. OK, what's the derivative of Q squared? 2Q dQ dt equals 2D dD dt. <laughs> All right. Now, do we know what Q is? What is Q? 5. Do we know what uh, D is? Do we? But can we find it? What is it? Well, OK, let's see. Uh, well, we know that at the point, we have Q is 5, so 5 squared plus 144 equals D squared. Uh, that's 25 plus 144. 25 plus 144 gives us 169. Now, do we know what 169 is? is what's the square root of 169? 
13, 13. Okay, so D equals 13. Do we know what DQ DT is? What is DQ DT? 0.5, is that correct? Is it positive or negative? Negative. negative. Why is it negative? It's decreasing because we're walking towards the corner. So if we're walking towards the corner, we're going down. Okay, so, so that should be negative. So now this is at the point where we plug in everything that we know. Uh, the twos can just go ahead and, and cancel, so we get 5 times dq dt, which is negative 0 0.5, is equal to d, which is 13, times dd dt. Uh, I, instead of negative 0.5, let's call this what it is, negative a half. So this is negative 5 halves. And then the 13 will come over as 1 over 13 equals dd dt. So I could say that the rate that the distance is changing is negative 5 over 26. Now, I don't know if it asks us for units, but suppose it did, what would we say? Negative 5 over 26 what? Meters per second, yes. Because we're measuring distances in terms of meters, and the time being measured in seconds is given to us right there. All right, so that's good. That's good. Yes? Yes. Unless it says to simplify. But isn't there something satisfying about simplifying? All right. Now I can see that I'm going to run out of time here. So I'm going to try to speed this one through. Power. We're going to do a speed run here. Okay. Y over X to the XY equals 2018. Why don't I find dy dx? What kind of problem is this? Implicit. Because there's some relationship between X and Y. I just don't have it written down explicitly. So I want to do implicit differentiation, but I don't want to do implicit differentiation like this because this is, to use a technical term, not very nice looking. <laughs> okay. How can I make this not very nice looking thing look nice? Logs. So before I take any derivative, I'm going to take the log of both sides. And when I take the log, I can pull the xy down. So xy log of y over x equals log of 2018. Again, this is not derivatives. This is just simple algebra. And because I have a log of division, sorry, log of, uh, yeah, division becomes a subtraction. So xy log y minus xy log x equals natural log of 2018. So this is basically saying, look, before you take a derivative, See if you can't express your relationship nicer. Usually you don't have to do this, but sometimes it helps. Take the derivative of everything. Here I have three things multiplying together. So what rule do I use? I still use product rule. Now what happens when you have the product rule of multiple functions? The answer is every function gets its turn. You get a turn. You get a turn. Every single function gets its turn. And you just put them together. So, here we go. We say take the derivative of x, and then the others stay as they are. So 1, y log y. Then we go to the next one. Take the derivative of the y, and the others stay as they are. So it's x, y prime, log y. Then we go to the next one, and the other two stay as they are. What's the derivative of log y? What is it? 1 over y times the derivative of y. Then you just do the same thing here. The derivative of x is 1 y log x. Then you go to the next term. Don't forget the minus here. The minus will, will get a lot of people. So if there's a minus here, make sure you subtract everything. Sometimes it's better to put a parenthesis. So x, derivative of y, y prime, log x stays alone. And then the xy, derivative of log x, 1 over x, derivative of log 2018, 1 over 2018. No, no, I'm just kidding. It's zero. You, you can still actually use the, the chain rule, by the way. It's technically legal. It's 1 over 2018 times the derivative of 2018, which is zero. Okay. All right. All right. Enough silliness. Okay. So here, y's cancel. Here, x's cancel. And now what you do is a game of, of, you know, find the things that look alike. So in other words, what things have a y prime? So there's a y prime, there's a y prime, and there's a y prime. So I take the things which have a y prime and I pull out the y prime. So x log y uh, plus x 
minus x log x y prime. And then I say, what's everything else? I'm going to subtract that. So there's a y log x, and I'm going to just go ahead and pull this minus out. Uh, then I also have here a, a y, and then over there it's going to become minus y log y equals zero. And now we move this over, then we'll divide. So you get y prime is y log x plus y minus y log y over x log y plus x minus x log x. All right, so there's that problem. Again, once you, you get past that first step, it's not very bad. Okay, number six. Number six looks intimidating, but once you look at it, it's like, oh, it's not so bad. So here's, here's how it works. We, we sketch on the left-hand side f prime. We don't give you a function, we give you a sketch of f prime. Now here's the thing that throws you off. You gotta remember, that's f prime of x. Now how do we know it's f prime of x? Because we say it's f prime of x here, we say it's f prime of x here, we say it's the derivative of f of x there. Because what do we want you to know? We want you to know that's f prime. Okay, that's important for us to remember. We want to sketch f double prime. How do f prime and f double prime relate? It's one more derivative. If I want to find the second derivative, I take the first derivative and do it one more time. So, is this increasing or decreasing? Increasing. What about here? Zero. So it's zero here. Increasing means positive. Increasing or decreasing? Decrease, which means I'm negative. Here? Zero. I'm zero. Decreasing, I got to be negative. So I'll something. What happens for the rest? Am I increasing or decreasing? Increasing. So what does that translate into? Positive. Is that the right picture? Probably not, but notice it says, look, I just need the zeros and the signs. And I'm done with part A. Part B. Where is f of x increasing and decreasing? Now remember, this is the function. If I want to know where the function is increasing or decreasing, where do I look? First derivative. So I look at the picture on the left. Now, increasing corresponds to where the first derivative is. Positive, which is here. So increasing is for x greater than or equal to 1. Where is it negative? Well, everywhere else. So it's decreasing for x less than or equal to 1. And that's part B. Part C. Where are the critical points? Which critical points do we have? Negative 3, because that's where my derivative is 0, and 1, because that's where my derivative is 0. Now, let's classify. I am negative, which means I'm going down, and then I'm negative, which means I'm going down. So negative 3, what kind of critical point is it? It's neither. It's neither max nor min. Because I go down, then go down. What about 1? What kind of critical point is it? Before the derivative is negative, after the derivative is positive, so I'm decreasing, then increasing, going down, going up. It's a min, local min. Now, I, I can't classify things as absolute, but I can classify things as local. That's part C. Okay, concave up and concave down. Concave up, when does that happen? In terms of the second derivative. Concave up is when my second derivative is positive. Well, that's here, below negative 3, and here above negative 1. Where am I concave down? Second derivative should be negative, which is this part. Negative 3 less or equal to x less or equal to negative 1. Okay, where are my inflection points? Inflection points are where? The inflection points are concavity changes. My concavity changes at negative 3 and negative 1. And we're done.